alpha, lambda 2, and GLB. And what you find is that for some scales, the GLB is not calculated because there's not enough items. So it's a little more fragile. But everywhere it is at estimated, 67 to 69, the GLB here is 71. So 67, you might go, ooh, 71, oh, suddenly over that magic 70. So it's a better estimator, but it doesn't always work. McDonald's Omega seems to be the number one winner of this game of which estimator should I use. It works on a different set of assumptions. It says that the means of variances are allowed to vary for true scores and errors. Um, it avoids assumption about constant means and variances. So it doesn't care. They're like, fine, they can all be different. It doesn't matter. When the tau equivalent model are met, omega will be as good as alpha, but it works when the alpha assumptions aren't held. So it's so violations of tau equivalent, the norm in psychology, the means and variances are not constant. Omega outperforms alpha. And, so, happily for us, it's available in R, Jamovi, and JASP, which are free software, free um, interfaces for R, that'll produce it. So, this is the one I'm going to recommend you argue for. Clearly, anything over 90 is like the magic golden standard, and in psychological research, almost never hit there. But in test scores, you want to make sure these items correlate well with each other. Yeah, this is for a high stake exam. You want 90, 80. You can publish this and sell it, maybe. Uh, 70. It's good for classroom and good for a PhD type research. And under 60, we saw earlier that it looks like random noise. So probably there's something seriously wrong here, folks. May I yes. I'm sorry. Um, you are comparing these at three different systems to measure the same things, but uh, you are giving the same threshold for that mm -hmm. you can start from different, uh, let's say. Well, what, the reason for looking at different estimators of reliability is the construct is the same, but what's the best way to estimate this value? Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is use McDonald's Omega, not Cronbach's Alpha. Again. But the interpretation is still the same. Sending the paper to uh, an editor and uh, they want a promo. Uh, yes, and you can give it to them, and then you can make a note that McDonald's all the like and, and put the. I would give them both mm -hmm. and say, please know. Okay. Ordinal rating scales are slightly different. It, Reliability of a test score is really quite straightforward, but when we're looking at the kind of Likert rating scales, there's a whole other problem in there is it's not only does this item on average correlate with the other item, how do the options within the rating scale behave? And this is something that we will see when we use Levant, we will show us about thresholds. And the threshold is the point at which you have a high probability of switching from the first option to the second option, from the second option to the third option. So this is, this is from a study that uh, I carried out. Um, this is the probability curves of um, what's the probability of choosing option one, strongly disagree, moderately disagree, okay, so mostly disagree, slightly agree, moderately agree, mostly agree, strongly agree. And these are rash and Andrich's rash modeling curves. And what they show is the distance between options is almost identical. So they're very equivalent in terms of how far apart the peaks are. Okay, and what we're hoping for is that the peak reaches 0.5. So there's a 50-50 chance at this point of choosing this option. These ones are a bit lower, so they're not chosen as frequently. 
but you get nice ordered transitions. And here you can see the probability of the first option, the changeover from strongly disagree to mostly disagree. You can see these nice, almost beautifully parallel curves showing that this response scale attracts nice ordered responding. It's in this article and it gets this result that cross uh, using Anditch's rating scale. But this is really item response theory. But what you'll find is when you use ordered categories, whether it's dichotomous, right, wrong, or ordered options, uh, like a weighted least squares means estimator, it's going to use this idea of the threshold, the point at which the probability shifts from the previous one to the next one. So there are six options, so there are five thresholds. And what we're looking for is that the probability of this, this threshold should be at a diff higher point on this scale than the, this threshold. We don't want the reverse ordered. So if there are items with reverse order, it suggests you've got the wrong response scale. So, this is the traditional Likert. I find it's problematic because if people are have an opinion, they agree or they disagree, they only get two choices. They only get two choices. So what if they're more than neutral, but not as much as agree. I'm kind of, I'm somewhere between. And the Likert scale doesn't allow for that, doesn't give you discrimination, which is a real problem because without discrimination, you don't get reliability. So that's why I use positively or negatively packed rating scales. The other problem with the Likert scale is what does this option really mean? Does it mean I don't know, I don't care, go away, I don't understand, I'm confused, I really am neutral. Nobody really knows what neutral means, so I always refuse to use a neutral point in a response scale. Better to have strongly disagree, disagree, agree, strongly agree, than have neutral. It's an interesting case, because in we, we, we thought in our center that this category neutral almost always doesn't work because of the specificity of Russian language. Ah. We thought that, okay, in English it should work, but we we'll always uh, cut it because then, this the category doesn't work. The problem is neutral is ambiguous. Yep. Am I neutral because I don't understand your question? Am I neutral because I don't care? Am I neutral because I'm middle biased? Am I neutral because I, I'm confused? Or I don't want to tell you? you know, it's not safe for me to tell you whether I agree or disagree. You know, like, so there's so many meanings in the word neutral that I think it's just a bad choice. So please don't do it. Uh, and what if we change neutral uh, or I don't know, for example? then it's not on the scale, it's out here. Yeah. You could have, I don't know, but then you got a lot of missing values because some people will go, oh shit, oh shit, yeah, oh, I don't care. Right, but at the same time, we make people choose. Yes, and that's why I like this scale because it says you have to choose, but you can choose. Yeah, it's not no, but it sure isn't very much. So, but it should be uh, good working for adults, but not for uh, I don't know, small children because it's hard yeah, to they, they, how young, I mean, especially preschool children, how they distinguish between, and that's why people will create basically yes, no scales, uh, like me, not like me. I suspect that children can make much more discriminating choices. They just don't have the verbal ability to communicate those preferences. Um, ask kids about what food they like and what clothes they want to wear. 
they have opinions and strongly held. They're just hard to verbalize. And I'm not sure that I would give a written questionnaire to anybody under the age of 10 anyway. Mm -hmm. But what about uh, scales when we uh, put not, um, not reading categories, so we don't describe it, just put a, for one to 10, for example. Okay. The thing is, without an anchor, what does 1 mean, what does 10 mean? The interpretation of 1 and 10 is ambiguous, it's uncertain. And what 10 means to you may not be what 10 means to the person answering the scale. So I always prefer to have verbal anchors so that I can defend my interpretation of what 3.25 means. What is motivation? Why are we are still used? Because it's quite a big discussion, but they are not very useful. But Because maybe people are not thinking about the interpretation of the response scale. And maybe they're just worried about the giving an answer. Um, I think you should guide respondents to say, this scale goes from 1, really bad, to 10, really good. And 5 means kind of neither good nor bad. You know, if you don't give some anchor a verbal anchor to the scale, how do you know what they're answering? Even Osgood's semantic differential has an anchor on one end and an anchor on the other end, and the midpoint is clearly I'm halfway between, and then you'll be biased to one or the other. That's what we're actually interested in. So you need to give people guidance. I would say minimum anchors verbal anchors on the end points at a minimum. And I prefer, I prefer to simply say, these are your choices. One, two, three, four, five, six. Those are your six choices. You must choose one um, that gets closest to what you feel or think. And most people go, oh, okay, I could do that. So we've used this scale even down to children, 9, 10 years old, and they seem to, they, they don't have a problem with it. Once children know how to read, they can tell, the, they, they know these feel different. Uh, and each category has enough uh, um, choices, so it's uh, the same frequency of choosing things? Oh, absolutely not. Uh, some, very few people will choose strongly disagree. But, but still you need it to make such a choice. So what I do is I write items that you should strongly disagree with. That, you know, if you disagree with this, if you say, assessment will help me learn better, and then I write an item that says, assessment is useless, if you believe it will help you, then you will not say yes to it's useless. And that way I can to, to wipe out some of the response set. Yes, um, Dimitri. Just to make the case, I have a pilot study, and this study shows me that my uh, Likert uh, scale, um, that I have to merge, for example, two categories. Yes, that can happen. And um, what should I do? Should I uh, make the main study with uh, these categories? Or should I make uh, the main study with already merged categories? Do you understand what I mean? Yes. Guess? What do you think uh, the answer I is? Mean, what merged? do you think I would say? Huh? What do you think I would say? I, I don't know. Okay. The point of doing the scale analysis is to prepare the data for reporting the results. If your scale analysis says the thresholds are problematic, you fix that, you say, the scales were not blah, 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 we fixed it, here's the results. So all of this is just preparation work to get to the result. I mean that, um, for example, I know that two categories uh, don't work. And after the scale analysis to get uh, the data, I merge two categories. Yeah, I understood. But, but then I have an opportunity to make new research. Sure. So when I make this research, should I... Um, 
merge the categories not only on uh, analysis but uh, when I write the items. For example, merge strongly disagree and disagree. It depends on the nature of the follow-up study. If the follow-up study is to build on the first study and you show that these response categories had mixed thresholds, then you fix it and you don't go back to that problem. But if you then want to say, well, actually, I want to do a methodological study and systematically compare under different conditions whether there's a possibility that the thresholds will get fixed okay. without me manipulating them, then you would do a different kind of study. You say, okay. previous study suggested there was a problem with, so we investigated it. So. Sorry, can I ask? Yes. So, what the positive Sorry? Positive look at. So yes. We have to disagree and to agree. Yes. So what about to make this equal? Strongly, uh, most disagree, and slightly disagree, and then? We actually did a study where we had eight options. Four negative, four positive, exactly like this, except we had slightly disagree and moderately disagree. We actually did that. We found the thresholds of strongly and mostly disagree kept mixing backwards and forwards. And the thresholds for slightly disagree and moderately disagree kept flopping backwards. So we took options one and two, made them one option. Everybody who chose option three or four became just option two. And it became positively packed and it worked fine. So, so the during the coding of the responses, so 1 and 2 was 1, 3 and 4, 2, and then 3, 4, 5, five six, 6. Yes, but only after we analyzed the threshold effect of having 8 options. And what we found is there were problems with the negative options crossing over each other. Okay, now the point of reliability is, do they group together? But that's not the only way to think about a scale. A scale can be thought of as from the items in the measure being very low, easy, easy to agree with, a little harder to agree with, and very hard to agree with, which is what a rash scale should look like. So here's a rash analysis of six questions from the scale the inventory that you're going to get. And what we did is we looked at the where do the items fit? The X's represent people. So you can see there are a few people down here where there are no items. None of the items fit here. Here's number one, number two, number four, number six, number five, and number three. Number three was the one that was hardest to agree with in terms of a rash scale. So you get these five items are pretty close to each other. That's what happens when you create a scale using a factor analysis or a scale analysis approach. Items that are very close to each other. Surprisingly, this one was harder to agree with. Our class becomes more supportive when we are assessed. That was harder to agree with than these ones in here. So it seems to me that this is not really a scale measuring from <coughs> very easy, everyone agrees, some people agree, almost no one agrees. This is a pool. And so reliability is often about do the items pool together, make a pond, and how deep is it? And so these ones clearly pool together. There's almost no difference between them. So from a rash point of view, this is a poor scale because there's no items here and no items up here, even though there are people who are disagree with this concept and really agree with this concept. There are no items that capture those people. So in the sense of scale as a continuum, like a measurement scale, this is not a good scale. As a concept of a factor, a group of items that are highly correlated, this is pretty good. These items are very close to each other. Do you see the difference, what I'm saying? 
the difference between a group of things that are very similar compared to a measurement. Yes? I wonder still, uh, when we are developing the scale, mm -hmm. we don't want to have items for everyone don't agree or it's very easy to agree. So we try to avoid such items. So, but, but still, of course, we want them on the scale, not on the one point. Well, but still. fortunately, this tells me there are one, two, three, four, five, six, and there's a code somewhere that tells you each X is four people. So there are a bunch of people down here who have opinions that are very low, but there's nothing that expresses what their feeling or sentiment or thought is. And to me, this is a sign that this is a pool of items, not a scale of items. So there's two different ways of using the, the word scale. So if I was reworking this, I would say, I want something to hear that if you don't agree with this, you really are off the scale, you are really negative. And I would like uh, some items in here and I would like something even stronger than these sentiments. But I, I can't agree with you because uh, okay. from minus one to minus two logits there are items. Because on this plot it's not the item difficulty but it's me of all the categories of each item. So, no, it's, this is the item location. Yeah, item location, but it's... Uh, it's not the threshold, I agree. Yeah. But uh, at the table on the left, you can see that the minimum difficulty is minus 2.26 mm -hmm. and the highest is 1.13. And look how so many are. There's not very much of a range in there. So what I'm saying is that this is an approach to scale reliability that is using the logic of rash analysis that is not what is meant by most psychology journals when they say you need to show us what the scale reliability is. But if you want to make a reliable scale, this is a really good way to start. Try to write something that describes almost everybody would agree with this. Almost nobody would agree with this. Most people will agree with this and then try to fill the gaps. That's a technique I've seen from uh, Larry Ludlow at Boston College and I think it's a really good approach to try and capture the range in the content area. But as it is, these items are pretty much all the same. So they're likely to be highly correlated because they're all pretty much the same probability of agreeing with them. So, scale analysis. I want to say it's a weak alternative to confirmatory factor analysis. CFA is far superior. That's Wednesday. But almost every journal will tell you, but I still want to see the scale reliability estimate. <laughs> Even though CFA is superior, they still, they're locked in the past. Their professors went to university when the professors, like Lee Cronbach, were teaching. And so it takes three or five generations before these traditions stop. So your job is to stop these old traditions and start new traditions. The RASH model can be a really helpful technique, but this is not a course on RASH analysis, so I'm not going to go any further than that. We're trying to get a pool of things. Do they agree with each other so that we can create a score that says, based on multiple indicators, this is where you lie between very disagree to very agree. This is why I say you shouldn't do scale analysis alone. To never be satisfied. SEM is the most robust tool to assess the test reliability. Such methods as latent variable modeling outperform current analyses of reliability. SEM, for example, demands large sample sizes. So if you don't have large sample sizes, of course you're going to report reliability. But even if you have large sample sizes, the journal will probably ask you to report reliability. So, now we're going to start playing with numbers. Okay. This data set is something you're going to use all week. It's a data set based on the inventory I created between 2003 and 2008. Student conceptions of assessment. 
It's the sixth version. There's a complete data set that you can download. And these are the articles that you can read if you want to really study it. Basically, these items, 33 items, say four big ideas. Assessment makes students, schools, and teachers accountable. How good is my school? How good is my teacher? How good am I? Or, assessment is bad. <laughs> the way they make us do it, but I don't pay attention. Or, it's just unfair, right? Because that's how some kids feel. Or, assessment helps me learn better and helps my teacher teach better. We all wish this was true, but it isn't always true. And, assessment is emotionally and socially beneficial. If only people were happy being assessed and people in, worked with each other under assessment conditions. If these things were true, maybe this would be better for us. But that's what these items are. And these are, that's the, wow, that looks okay on that screen. So here's one, two, three, the four big ideas. And this is a hierarchical model. So I created this model iteratively. This is version six, so there were five versions before this, where I built this model with New Zealand high school students. So, student future. Assessment is important for my future career or job. Well, almost anywhere in an exam society, they go, damn straight. If I don't get high marks, I don't go to university. If I don't get high marks, I don't get a good job. Assessment results predict my future performance. It's probably a lie, but a lot of people believe this, right? That if I take a test now, it's a good prediction of what, how I'll do later on. Assessment results show how t intelligent I am. Well, we know that's also not true, but people believe it, that my test score is an indication of my intelligence. Assessment tells my parents how much I've learned. This is especially true in the school system. At university, maybe it's not relevant. And what we're going to see when we come to the Brazil, New Zealand uh, students who did this questionnaire, the, my Brazil colleague took that that item out because he said this is not relevant for higher education but the other ones were retained. School quality. Assessment measures the worth or quality of schools. Assessment provides information on how well schools are doing. Notice how close, similar in wording these two items are. So that should be a little warning for you. Maybe these two items are redundant. Maybe it's only one thing instead of two things. But I made it work. Improvement. I look at what I got wrong or did poorly on to guide what I should do learn next. Welcome to self-regulation. I pay attention to my assessment results in order to focus on what I can do better next time. I make use of the feedback I get to improve my learning. I use assessment to take responsibility for my next learning steps. I use assessments to identify what I need to study next. So it's all about how do I use the results to improve. So this is assessment for improving myself as the learner. My teachers use assessment to help me improve. If only that were true. <laughs> teachers use my assessment results to see what they need to teach me next. Again, if only that were true. Students who say yes to this believe that that's what teachers are doing every time they give them a test. I hope it's true. Assessment shows whether I can analyze and think critically about a topic. Assessment is checking off my progress against achievement objectives or standards. Assessment is a way to determine how much I've learned from teaching. Assessment helps teachers track my progress. All of this is what educational assessment theory says should be happening, right? But we know a lot of times it doesn't happen because I got too many kids and not enough time, and too many tests and blah. Assessment is irrelevant. There was a factor here. I ignore assessment, but it fell apart as a sub-factor. And you're going to get to play with this data later in the week to see if you can fix it. And so assessment has little impact on my learning. I ignore or throw away my assessment results. I ignore assessment information. At university, I saw classmates doing this. They didn't want to know. I just got a 33, you know, like out of 100. You know, they didn't want to know. So this happens. You see high school kids all the time. Mm, blame the teacher, right? 
Assessment is valueless. Assessment is unfair to students. Assessment results are not very accurate. Teachers are over-assessing. Assessment interferes with my learning. This is the, you know, assessment's just bad. And there are lots of people who are anti-testing who will say that too. Lots of academics would agree with this. Affective, personal enjoyment. I find myself really enjoying learning when I am assessed. Hey, are you weird or something if you say yes to this? Uh, assessment is an